Yo, what's up, everybody? On this episode of the Bullpen Podcast, I'm going to be chopping it up with Raphael Hawksley, a.k.a. the Bitcoin Traveler. And man, what this guy did was pretty amazing. So basically, he traveled the world in 12 months, visiting 20 countries and capturing over 178 hours of footage, including 28 interviews all on one Bitcoin. Man, this is a really good interview. So you already know. Let's do it. Oh, wait. One more thing before we get to the podcast. In this podcast, The Crypto Bully, any co-host and his guests do not give financial or investment advice and encourage you to do your own research on all topics mentioned. Do not invest into this market what you can't afford to lose. I bet I know what you're thinking. Is this really Morgan Freeman? Well, unfortunately not. But Lyndon thought it would be a good idea to use such a soothing voice for the legal mumbo-jumbo to smooth things over. Now, let's do it. Now entering the Bitcoin Podcast Network. Play ball! Bullpen Podcast, number nine, the Crypto Bully. Wow! <laughs> he makes it look so easy. And that ball has left the stadium. Yo, what's up, everybody? All right, so I'm pretty excited about today's episode. I have a guest on that has been doing a lot of amazing things and it's still continuing to do a lot of amazing things. And this actually really fascinated me, one, because I'm a huge uh, fan of traveling. I love to travel. I've always wanted to travel around the world. And this gentleman here has actually done it. And what makes it even cooler is that he did it with one Bitcoin. So this is a guy who basically traveled around the world with one Bitcoin in 12 months, visiting 20 countries, capturing over 178 hours of footage, including 28 interviews. And that is amazing. So I'm super stoked to have him on the show today. Uh, So without further ado, I'll go ahead and bring our guest in. This is uh, Mr. Raphael Hoxley, a.k.a. The Bitcoin Traveler. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing quite well. Thanks for having me on the show. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, no problem, man. I honestly appreciate you uh, taking the con- time to just come on to the show and chop it up. Um, I'm curious, honestly, where, like, where are you at right now? What time is it? <laughs> well, uh, at the time right now is a little over 5 p.m. because I am in Krakow, Poland, of all places. Wow. What's the weather like over there right now? <laughs> it's shitty. <laughs> he said, hey, <laughs> man, it, it's, it's probably cold over there, right? It is. It's it's cold. It's rainy. It's dreary. But I'm used to it. I'm used to it. I'm a Portland, Oregon native. Oh, I'm from right northwest up there. So I'm used to like nine months of nothing but gloom. Wow, that's funny, man. You know what? Funny. My, one of my favorite places in the world as of now to go is actually Seattle, Washington, and it's for okay. that reason. Like I love that kind of rainy weather. Like just it's it's for me. It's just so relaxing. So that's that's hilarious. Yeah, I find it relaxing from time to time and also productive as well because you're not too I don't feel too guilty about staying in and uh, and just thinking about stuff or writing and editing this documentary that I've got going on in the book as well. Yeah, very true. Oh yeah, we're going to talk a lot more about that, man. It's that's pretty interesting what you're doing. Um so, you know, just for the people who may not be as familiar with you, why don't you just give them uh tell them a little bit about yourself and just kind of let them know how you kind of got involved in blockchain and crypto to start with. Sure. Yeah. So like you mentioned, my name is Raphael Hawksley from Portland, Oregon, and I pretty much grew up there. I was an architect of sorts for a while. I designed homes and whatnot. And and I actually heard about Bitcoin way back in 2010. Wow. That's when I first heard about it. And I heard about it around there from a few friends. I've always been a bit of a nerd, a bit of a geek, uh, but I didn't do anything about it because... 
I I saw that it was being used on Silk Road and for all sorts of illegal things. And that's what I read from the media headlines. And I just didn't dig deeper. I just mm-hmm. took the media headlines at face value and decided to run with Wow. So, and then it pretty much led you. Mm-hmm. Huh? No, no. So, so yeah. So, basically, you heard about it and then it kind of just uh, uh, sparked you a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I heard about it, but I didn't do anything with it. And then in 2013, same situation. Uh, I saw it again, heard about it again, thought, you know what, this is just a bubble that's going to pop. And it did, but it didn't go away. Right. Right. And so when I heard about it for another time in 2017, um, then I thought to myself, man, it is not dead. It isn't dead because of government. It isn't dead because of bubble popping. What is going on? Why is it still alive and king? I need to actually dig deeper past the headlines. So that's when I started to really dig into it, find out about its uh, its the blockchain and how it's um, decentralized, not controlled by any kind of central entity, and and the fact that Bitcoin is deflationary. All of these words just started just popping up, and uh, and it inspired me to go and go to a Bitcoin meetup in Portland, Oregon. I said, okay, I need to talk to the people who who are organizing meetups about this and find out from them, kind of like from the horse's mouth, right? Uh, a little bit more about this topic and more than anything else i was curious about these people what were these people going to be like were they super anarchistic what did they believe in what did they stand for and so i went to this meetup i was just blown away i was blown away by this community they were not pretentious they weren't any closed mindedness of any sort at all they were open minded to everything they introduced me to to how to buy my first Bitcoin, how to do everything, how to set everything up. And that was kind of the spark for the trip, the genesis of it, because I started to wonder if communities around the world were like that. Were they composed of these people who were just genuine and interested in sharing uh, things like uh, freedom and human rights and um everything the blockchain offers, right? Were they like that around the world? Or was this just a Northwest thing? And that's why I decided to go and, and find out. I've always wanted to travel around the world, always wanted to do it. I was finally in a place in my life that I could, meaning not necessarily financially, but more of just a place in my life because of things that happened uh, with family and other stuff like that that I won't go into too much. But basically, I was just, I was ready to kind of leave that old life behind and and I bought one Bitcoin and off I went to try and discover if I would get my liver stolen or not. Wow. <laughs> he said, I, that's hilarious. Wow. So I, I'm curious, at what price did you buy that Bitcoin? You know, funny enough, it was about where it is now, a little lower. I bought it at 4700 in September of 2017. Nice. And, uh, and I, was, I wasn't sure because, I, again, I had been pretty new to Bitcoin and blockchain before I left. I had just gotten into it about three, four months before I had left. So I was quite new to it. And I hadn't even purchased or done or sold anything on local Bitcoin. So I knew that during my travels, that was going to be one thing that I'd have to contend with was uh, in China and in these other places that I was planning to go to. I was going to have to cash out a little bit of that Bitcoin for for local fiat and I was worried about that. I was wondering, oh man, if I if the transactions take this long to go through, am I going to just send the transaction and then the person on the other end is going to be like, okay, well see ya. Right. Thanks for sending me the Bitcoin, you know, great. Or if if they insisted on meeting somewhere kind of off the beaten path with nobody around, if I was going to get mugged or anything like that. Those were those were all thoughts that were coursing through my head and my worries. And I mean my friends and family, no one no one was uh, supportive. They weren't. They weren't, wow. of course, holding me back from it. They just, right. they just kept reminding me that my kidneys were worth something, and yeah. they had an actual function in my body. So I should keep them there instead of getting them stolen. Wow. Yeah. That's wow. That's crazy. So I mean, yeah. I mean, you definitely took a huge leap. And even thinking about that, so you at the time you bought the coin, uh, that one Bitcoin, that was right before the bull market basically came into effect. Like, how, I mean, was it difficult for you not to just be like, okay, I'm going to just sell this old Bitcoin right now and cash out? Like, what was that like? <laughs> oh, you know what? You know, it was just such a, a cocktail mix of emotions. It was such a roller coaster ride throughout the entire 
journey of it going up and it later on going down. Uh, and you mentioned like, should I have sold out? The funny thing is, I remember being at that time, yeah, uh, into the swell of of bullishness and the swell of emotion, and just at that time, I wasn't thinking to myself, you know, oh, I'm going to cash this out and and ride on it for the forever. Instead, what I was thinking was, you know what? There is no ceiling to this Bitcoin. It is just going to keep riding up. I'm going to travel forever on this one Bitcoin. <laughs> That was the general mindset that I had. And especially because at that time, around that time, I forget the exact date, but, uh, but John McAfee, he was still quite well respected in the space at the time. Uh, and he had tweeted that, that infamous tweet, right? That Bitcoin would hit $500,000 per coin or else he'd eat his own dick. Yeah. <laughs> on that TV. You know, so I thought to myself, man, here is a respected, respectable person who has set up a software companies and cybersecurity companies, if he has this much faith in it, that he's willing to put his bait and tackle on the line, right. his family jewels on the line <laughs> for this, then, then why would I cash out? Why would I sell at a measly $20,000? Why not just you know keep riding this wave until it hits 100000 or more? So... Yeah, so that was that was really the uh, the emotion for it, and then of course when it started to go down, uh, did I have regrets? Certainly, you know. But being thirty something years old, I've I've learned to live with regrets. Yeah, you know? yeah, that's very <laughs> true, man. That's that's uh, that's really yeah, that's definitely important. Kudos to you, man, uh, for not just cashing out and uh, you know taking that road. I mean, you obviously stuck with it. And I definitely think you gain a lot from it. Obviously, I mean, you have a documentary that's coming out from it. You, you know, uh, write a book, written a book that's going to be coming out from it. And I'm sure with this experience and traveling to all of these places, I'm sure it came with so much insight and knowledge and experience that is is almost priceless uh, compared to the, you know, the physical price of what, you know, what you could have sold that Bitcoin for at the top of the market. Um, but uh, I like so, the way you think, man. I like the way you think. That's exactly how I like to look at it too, you know, that's that silver lining that's really keeping me going. Right. So, yeah. yeah. Makes a lot of sense. It definitely makes a lot of sense, man. Which is awesome. Um, like date. So do you know, like approximately date wise when it was, you were, uh, uh, when exactly you were doing all that traveling? Yeah. So I started in September and I ended in September. Mm, okay. So September, is it of 2017? September, mm. September 2017 to September 2018. Yep. Gotcha. Okay, man. And yeah, you went a lot of places and got a lot of footage. What is like your, what's it, like your favorite place you went that you experienced? That's a, that's a great question. And I like to approach it from a couple different uh, aspects, right? Mm -hmm. Because each place really had its own uh, uniqueness to it. And so I'd say, I'd say that, for example, Natural Wonders was China. They had, of course, it's such a big country that they had some um, incredible uh, hills and, and mountains and structures and everything like that. Mm. But then people, the people were the most amazing in Myanmar, in what used to be Burma, right? It's right over there next to Thailand. Mm -hmm. they, they were just some of the most amazing people because they have not been jaded by tourism, they haven't been overrun by tourism, and it's still, I, I suppose, fairly rare to see a tourist in some of those cities. So when I'd be going through, I would be genuinely stopped and and talked to and and asked about where I'm from and what it's like and how my travels are going. Just the people were genuinely friendly and curious. I felt I felt safe really over there, even though there was so much, well, so much poverty to be frank. Yeah. Right. Wow. So yeah, like, I'd say that was, yeah, that was, yeah, that was your favorite place. Wow. That, that makes me want to actually go visit there. <laughs> That's, yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah. definitely. It's one of the, like, for example, there's uh, in Myanmar, there's a place called Old Bagan. Mm -hmm. It is the, the ancient city where there are, I forget exactly how many, eight, 900 temples mm. in one area. And they're just scattered across the landscape. You go between them, either, uh, walking or on a bicycle and i swear it is the the closest i've ever come to feeling like indiana jones <laughs> some of these temples were completely deserted no one in sight and you'd walk to them 15 20 minutes not seeing a single soul and then you'd come upon this temple just 
growing as it were out of the sand and out of the dirt and you'd walk in and it was just like wow it was just it was amazing that sounds amazing that is crazy awesome <laughs> wow 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 Wow. Yeah, man. That's why I love traveling, man. You get to see so many different things and experience so many different things. Um, It's amazing to see what people have done and created over the world throughout the time. Right. That humans. Right. You here. sound like you've done some traveling, too. What are some of your favorite places? You know what? The funny part is I've, I've done a lot of traveling, but most of my traveling has been here within the U.S. So I've purposely haven't traveled really overseas much. Um, because when I do it, I want to go on a complete hiatus. I mean, I want to take like a year or two and just <laughs> see, you know, kind oh, of, yeah. I'm, I'm almost kind of what you did and just sink in, man. And like, I want to do it kind of just spur of the moment, no real plans, just go with the flow type of deal. Um, oh yeah. That's a beautiful thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. But if I think about the places I've been in the U.S. that are my favorite, by far, Seattle, Washington is probably number one on the list. Love it there. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely amazing. And then second to that, it's actually a small town or city in uh, South Carolina, actually where I'm at right now, and it's called uh, Greenville. Um, and hmm. I love it here. It is super small compared to any other larger city like Dallas or Seattle or anything like that. But it is so homey. It's I mean, the people here are super nice. Southern hospitality. Like, you know, it's it for me. I'm a vegan. There's plenty of food options here for me, which is also awesome. Like it's mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah, it just feels amazing. So, yeah, those are my are definitely my favorite two places that I've been. Dude, I got to say, I envy you too, man. I envy you a little bit there because I've never been uh, too much east outside of the West Coast. I've oh. been up to Vancouver, Canada and down to Tijuana. And then I think as far as east as I've ever gone has been like Salt Lake City. Oh, but I haven't wow. gone further out east. So I'd love to get out there to the Carolinas, Florida sometime. Never been to New York either. What? I'll see that oh. someday. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, man, you definitely got it. I've been all over the East Coast, man. So uh Boston, Philly, Maine, Connecticut, uh New York, uh Jersey, Florida, um yeah. DC. I've been all over there, man. It's it's pretty yeah, you should definitely get there. It's pretty amazing, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I know, I know. I've always been always wanted to go. I just for some reason just haven't gone. It's pretty trippy. I mean a lot of a lot of uh, other stuff happened in my life that just, uh, you know, didn't kind of allow me to travel until recently. But but someday I'm absolutely going to go to that East Coast. Yeah, that'll be cool, man. Yeah, I think you'll definitely. And enjoy I'll have it. to hit up Greenville for sure. Yeah, dude, definitely hit up Greenville. You need to come to a place called. Um, it's they have a like a little um, water area. It's called Reedy Park. Oh my God, um, it's a it's like a it's literally like a little waterfall in the middle of a of this small downtown city. It is amazing. Dude, makes yeah. me want to go right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely cool, man. So, um so like okay, with all the traveling you did, right? You went to all of these different countries. Like how difficult was it to put that Bitcoin to use? Was it was it really difficult for you to spend it? Um was it problems or was it or, you know, was it kind of staggered were some places simpler than others or you know, how did that kind of go? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Let's see. There were certainly some places that were simpler. I mean, just, of course, the larger metropolis and financial banking capitals of the world, Singapore, Hong Kong, New Delhi, uh, Zug in Switzerland because of the Crypto Valley over there as well. Paris was easy. You know, all those big, big metropolises, you're definitely going to find a few crazy people (laughs) accepting and selling and buying Bitcoin, you know, so those were super easy. But I was pleasantly surprised as well in some of the other areas. Uh, Angkor Wat in Cambodia, I actually mm-hmm. I found a, a, a hostel that accepted Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Litecoin. Yeah. And they accepted it because the guy running, it was like a co-working space that also doubled as a hostel. And so, mm-hmm. of course, he's the kind of nerdy, geeky type. And he didn't actually advertise that he accepted it. The only way that I found that was through, uh, through a Bitcoin meetup in Singapore. I was telling a guy about my travels, and he's like, oh, if you're heading out there to Cambodia, you should check out this guy and his co-working space because they accept it. And that's how it kind of went around the globe. One of the 
one of the things that I focused on primarily was to attend as many crypto, blockchain, and Bitcoin, and Ethereum, etc. meetups as I could find and build as much of a network as possible because of the way I was traveling, right? So one of the questions that people have when they ask me how I did it, or even they don't even ask a question, they just say, no, no, there's no way that you went around the world on $5,000, even if it did go up to 20 and then back down. I mean, how did you do it? Right. Uh, and I did it because I just travel, hack the balls off wow. of everything. So I, I couch surfed as much as possible. I have a I have a profile on like couchsurfing.com, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I would just I'd send out couch surfing requests like a beast almost wow. every day, wow. sending them out. Uh, and then also the meetups when I'd go before even going to the meetups, I would contact the the person leading it and say, Hey, this is what I'm doing. I'm going around the world on this one Bitcoin. Do you have anybody that's interesting that I could interview or talk to? And also, by the way, if you have anybody with a couch who's willing to let me crash for a night or two, let me know. Yeah. So that's how I did it because one of the biggest expenses besides transportation is is accommodation. Right. So, I mean, I saved a hell of a lot by just doing that. And then as far as transportation went, of course, airline tickets or train tickets I had to pay with with fiat, but right. but otherwise I would try and hitchhike as much as possible, uh, or walk, of course, if it wasn't too far or too time consuming, right? Uh, and just those kinds of things. So, the, so that's how I did it there. And I had I had three methods of using that Bitcoin, uh -huh. right? Uh, and my one rule was that I had to use anything that I paid for would come from that one Bitcoin, mm. but I did not have the rule that uh, I could only eat or stay or be transported by people or companies that accepted crypto. Gotcha. And I, I didn't have that rule because, first of all, it would be impossible. Yeah. <laughs> completely impossible. And two, because it wasn't really realistic. And here's why. Um, because you can't even do that with the almighty U.S. dollar. True. That is true. See, so... There are people who have experimented, and there's even a documentary like Life on Bitcoin, I think, where a young married couple, they try and live for a few months or something like that on just Bitcoin by, by paying only with it, right? Uh -huh. And perhaps that's feasible for them because they stay just in the United States. But when you go traveling around the world, uh, you're, you're going to encounter many different kinds of currencies, and you're going to have to use them. So if I was going to... Uh, a hostel in Myanmar or a bar in uh, in India, right? And I had I had the U.S. dollar. It wouldn't be accepted, right? Yeah, right. not not obviously. Obviously, if it was like a ten dollar a night hostel, and I put down a Benji, you know, hundred bucks, then sure they'll take it. Yeah. Right? But but my point is that me on a budget, I'm not going to do that, right? I'm going to be like, here's five bucks for a $5 meal. And they're going to be like, no, I don't know if that converts. And uh, no, I can't. Or even more fascinatingly enough, for example, Starbucks, an American chain, right? A staple of the American chain. Mm -hmm. uh, a Starbucks anywhere, even here in Poland or, or in India or anywhere else, you can't pay with the US dollar. You can't. Yeah. You know, the employee's just not allowed to take it. You have to either have a a credit card or you have to have local money. So that's where that rule came from, that I was going to experience life on one Bitcoin, experience its volatility, and the way that I was going to use it was threefold. Uh, one, at the start of my journey, I had a BitPay Visa. So I loaded it up with a third of my Bitcoin, and I paid using that Visa wherever that card's accepted. And then two, I, I had a, my little electronic wallet on my phone, Jacks is what I chose to use, and uh, and I'd pay for example if a hostel in Hong Kong or like I was in Shenzhen, China, and I found a, a bar called Bionic Brew, and they accepted a few different cryptocurrencies, so I was able to pay just using my phone. Nice, right, and the wallet on there, and then the last third I had on a hardware wallet, and I stuffed that deep into my smelliest socks. <laughs> emergency fund you know if, if all hell broke loose if somebody stole my wallet with my bit pay and if somebody stole my phone with my electronic wallet at least i'd have that and i'd be able to uh, trade it for fiat on like local bitcoins or something so that's the, those were my rules those uh, that was how i did it 
basically right there. Wow. That's pretty awesome, man. Yeah. So you basically just backpacked the world, <laughs> which yeah. is, that's pretty awesome, dude. Yeah. Like, that's really awesome. So, like, I'm guessing in, like, when you did this then, I guess you were kind of just, like, did you plan out certain countries that you were going to go to before you went? Or did you literally just like, yo, I'm, I'm leaving and I'm about to just wing, wing of most of this? Oh, man, I'd love to say, you know, that I just winged it and I was spontaneous. That's certainly what the writer in me wants to say, you know, the guy who's like, yeah, this would be great for TV and drama. And just to say, I'm this rootin' tootin' cowboy who was like, fuck the world, I'm out there, I'm going to do my own stuff. Right. <laughs> but no, no, I, I had a plan. I had a plan at the beginning. The funny thing is that it didn't take long for it to go out the window. <laughs> <laughs> As I discovered soon enough, you know, I knew and, and I ticked off of the plan. I did China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, um, and then Thailand. And then it started to kind of break down in Thailand because I started for, for good ways, too, because I, I started to make enough connections mm. where people were inviting me or at least connecting me with people in other countries. So at that point, it became a zigzag. And from Thailand, I ended up going to Myanmar, that was actually a funny thing. Um, mm. I, I went there. I, I didn't plan to go to Myanmar. And maybe that's why, funny enough, maybe that's why I enjoyed the country so much because I didn't know anything about it and have any expectations. Right. I don't know if you've ever had that like with a movie, right, where somebody's talked up a movie and they said, oh, this is the best movie of all time. You've got to watch it. You'll love it. And then you go and see it and you're like, eh. Right. Versus not knowing anything about that movie at all and then going and being pleasantly surprised. Right. Very true. Yeah. Yeah. So it was the same with Myanmar. I went out there because um, there was this family that had invited me because the, the wife there, she was there writing her PhD paper into a book. And it was called Mon Why Money Matters in Myanmar. Wow. That's what it was called. And so I went out there to kind of interview her and, and stay over there and check out the country and things like that. But, but yeah, after that, it just became a zigzag all over Southeast Asia. Nice. <laughs> that's awesome. So a little bit of planning, a little bit of randomness. That's a, that's, I think that's a good recipe for a good time, man. Definitely. 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 So, hey, out of curiosity, when you've traveled like the East coast and whatnot, have you seen uh, payments in BTC or, or anything like that? It is pretty damn difficult to find stuff okay. like that. Um, you know, one thing I am excited about actually that I just realized I was, I was uh, reading an article in the news that apparently Yelp, basically they included a filter where now you can actually find places that accept cryptocurrency or Bitcoin. What? I think, yeah. I was like, what? Oh, that's like Yelp. That's bananas. Like that's crazy. So yeah, I, yeah. I think, yeah, I, I definitely want to use that when I travel now, because I really want to see how well I can utilize that. Um, because I mean, that's amazing. Cause that's one thing that I always talk about. I've talked to a couple of people who've traveled over the world and I really feel like you, the U S is kind of behind the curve on, you know, mm -hmm. uh, finding resources where you can actually spend your cryptocurrency. So, you know, when I see right. stuff like the Yelp article, it really excites me like, okay, you like, especially Yelp. I'm like, yo, that is a huge company that is really jumping on to the cryptocurrency train. Like, okay, maybe we should make this accessible for people and make it easier to find places. So I'm like, yeah, I'm really excited. And I'm actually going back to, so weird. I'm about to travel. I'm going to LA. So I'll be on the West coast uh, in May. And then I'm going all the way east. Cause I have to go to New York. So I'm super using Yelp. <laughs> like nice. definitely yeah so that that'll be pretty cool man but um yeah going in the past no it was not simple it was not an easy task it was not simple to find um so i look forward to hopefully that changing so yeah it'll be it'll be pretty interesting man so dude it will change for sure for sure some yeah. great news by the way with yelp thanks for sharing that that's oh, yeah. absolutely fascinating yeah, yeah. No, no I mean, a hundred percent believe it. The one thing that I learned, my paramount lesson from this entire travels, was just how incredible the blockchain space is. Yeah, it really, is, it, it confirmed everything that I saw in Portland, Oregon, uh, and it really made me deep down a believer in just blockchain and it being the future for not just cryptocurrencies but all sorts of endeavors to, to have freedom and own 
the digital world that we're moving into so much so. Wow. And that's that's why I'm doing the documentary about it and writing the book about it and just kind of being as someone who who talks to people about it because the reason why I did not get into Bitcoin or blockchain earlier on uh-huh. is because I just read the headlines. That's mm-hmm. all I did. And the headlines were structured in a way to shut down my brain. Yes. All right. When when um, Warren Buffett says that Bitcoin is rat poison, right? When Charlie Munger, his right hand man, says that trading Bitcoin is like trading freshly harvested baby brains. Yes, crazy. Right? They they've gone on record and said that, and these are people who are watched and respected by millions of people around the world. But listen to those statements, or even just look at the classical statement that Bitcoin is a bubble. When you think about that statement, what that statement is doing is shutting down people's brains because they instantly see their hard-earned money popping and vanishing. Right. right? There's no way of, of reinflating a bubble. So when they see that, they feel that, and it shuts down their brains automatically. They're like, okay, this, uh, this isn't something that I, I should pursue. It's a waste of time to be curious about it. And they don't look into it. And I feel that that's a shame. That's a, that's a shame because the truth about blockchain and Bitcoin is that it is a revolutionary new technology that will really open up doors for us that we can't even imagine. Yeah. Uh, and that's what, that's what I need to do. I need to tell people about it. And that's why I respect what you're doing, man, and having these podcasts and telling people and sharing people in such a casual way. You're, you're really opening up the real truth about blockchain to your audience. And that's, that's commendable, man. I uh, appreciate it, man. I, I, yeah. Thank you. I definitely appreciate it. And it is what you just said is such a good point because that's, it's, I mean, I, I pretty much have the same story. You know, I was reading the headlines and then, you know, I'm seeing things like, Oh, you know, um, mining is super expensive. It's not feasible for the average person to mine, not even knowing like, okay, maybe I should look into other things. The fact that other cryptocurrencies exist and, you know, um, luckily I just had a good friend who, even though I was reading those headlines, he was still in it. And I'm like, I'm like, I, I've known this guy for, you know, at that time, 12, 13 years. And I'm like, okay, wait a minute. I'm reading these headlines that are saying this is horrible, but yet he's still doing it. I'm like, either I'm missing something or he's really stupid. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I don't <laughs> think he's that stupid because I've, from all of these years that I've known him, he's never done anything stupid. So, I was just like, okay, let me talk to him. So I talked to him. We had a conversation and it was just like, dude, the light bulb went off. And I'm like, oh my God. And I'm like, that's that's exactly why you never just only pay attention to those headlines, man. Because they can be so wrong. (laughs) So wrong. So see, that's that's another thing that's fascinating about the times that we're living in. mm -hmm. I certainly do mean the times that we're living in because one reason those headlines are so successful is because we are living in times that everything is changing rapidly. Yeah. And we are exhausted by it. Right? There there's always a new update on my phone and and I have a, a Google phone, right? So there's they're changing something or other or Facebook is changing something. Right. A new interface here and there and I have to get used to it and relearn it. I'm kind of forced to do that. So I'm exhausted. I'm technologically exhausted. So here, when this new technology, you know, Bitcoin blockchain, uh, comes into the picture and is asking for my attention and is asking for my time, and I have to juggle between being curious about blockchain versus being curious about AI because it'll somehow make my job obsolete or, or machine learning because that'll make my job obsolete in a different way. You know, when I, all of these headlines are grabbing up my attention. And I'm exhausted. And the first time that I, I hear from somebody respectable like Warren Buffett or someone and they say, no, blockchain is, is rat poison. Yeah. Well, then in the back of my brain, I'm like, okay, well, then I don't need to worry about it. Right. I don't need to worry. I'm not going to be curious about it. I'm just going to believe what they say because they are well respected and whatnot. Right. And that's a shame. Again, that's a shame. And it's, it's, you know, it's it's logical because we really are limited with our time and our attention spans and our mm-hmm. everything else. So, 
Yeah, that's true. It is. Yeah, that's yeah. why I always one of the number one things I preach to anybody in crypto is do your own research. I don't care if you completely hate the person you're listening to or you completely <laughs> love the person you're listening to. It's like, why wouldn't you go and verify whatever they're saying? You know, um, I mean, don't right. get me wrong. There's definitely people that you can listen to and be like, OK, I know nine point ninety nine point nine 99.9% of the time that they say something, I know it's going to have merit, but it still doesn't hurt to go fact check, you know, just to make sure because uh, nobody's perfect all the time. Nobody's right all the time. So, you yeah, know. I appreciate that perspective. That is a healthy perspective now. Yeah, 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 definitely appreciate it, appreciate it, man. So, all right, man, let's let's talk about this documentary, man. You have, <laughs> this is crazy, you have over seven days of footage, man, and yeah. that's that's crazy. And obviously, you know, you you already said you're going to make that into a documentary. Um, and I think if I if I remember correctly, when I was looking on your website, or I think it was the, either your website or on YouTube, basically you have a plan to make this and then kind of just spread it out as far as you can. Uh, like, how, how is that going? What is that going to look like? Um, the documentary. I want to see this, man. Like, I'm really excited for this. Hey, me too. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to see it as well. I want to be like, oh wow, it's finally done. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So a lot of hours of footage. Um. Not all of it's, of course, the best, but some of it's really, really freaking good. Yeah. And candid, too. There's this one scene that I don't know why it popped in my head right now, but I like it. Um, I was able to sneak into the press room where Vitalik Buterin and a few other speakers were just kind of chilling out <laughs> over there and talking. And it was great. I captured some footage of Vitalik like being human which was fantastic. You know, he was tossing a T-shirt around with a guy and just chatting and talking and Wow. Uh, it was just fascinating because later on when I when I interviewed him, he, he it's almost like he could, it turned into a completely different person. He just um it was very robotical and mechanical and uh, almost alien about it. So yeah. But anyhow, yeah, a lot of footage, a lot of footage trying to chew through it, trying to make it. Um I don't have a film background in the sense of editing and putting things together. Gotcha. So what I'm doing is just sorting the wheat from the chaff as it were right digging from those for those pearls in the mud right and then once i have all of those without really good footage then i'm hoping to hire or partner with a, an editor to really put it together into something that's quality nice. uh, quality and i'm debating too i'm going through all this footage and i'm thinking you know i'm wondering if it's going to be a film or maybe it'll be a series mm. because they just have so much damn footage right, right. so uh it's a 30 minute episode per country or something like that that'll be really yes, cool that'll be great yeah that would yeah be, yeah i mean you definitely got enough footage for it that's for sure i know i know yeah so what i'm doing with that but then i also of course i need to distribute it somehow i need to drum up support because right now of course in the uh in, in the world there's a lot of shouting going on and pay attention to me pay attention to me for all sorts of different projects Right. And really, the person with kind of the loudest, biggest bullhorn wins. Right. And to have the loudest, biggest bullhorn, you have to have money. So originally with the, with the documentary, what I was hoping to do was to get money through donations. Yeah. And I set up like a, like a campaign on Fundition, which is a type of campaign, kind of like Kickstarter, but more crypto focused. Uh -huh. uh, and I did things like that. But donations weren't really coming in that well. So actually, what I plan to do is uh, is release the book of the film, mm. and I'm hoping that by releasing the book, I'm able to get enough funds from the sale of the book to be able to then properly create this documentary film or series. Man, I, so, I, yeah. So I don't know if you caught that. What was that? No, I was gonna say I, I love that. I love how you are really taking the things that you have, the footage that you have so seriously, and you're not just going to like, say, just put it out. Um, I love how you want to have a certain, um, um, certain level of quality that you want to produce when it comes to that, that film and that, you know, the documentary or series or however you, you choose to put that out, man. A lot of respect for that. Um, because I, I know, 
I know you have some awesome footage, man, and I'm sure it could be tempting to just, you know, you just want to put it out. But I think that the fact that you've really taken the time to make sure that you put it out in a quality that is, um, in you know, in comparison to other things that are out, I think that people are going to receive it a lot better because of that, man. Kudos to you for that. Seriously. I appreciate that, man. I really do. Because I want quality. The reason why I want to set this documentary out there in motion the book too is because I want the mainstream audience right. to see it uh, because that's what I'm focusing on in the documentary. I'm kind of focusing on this, what I've seen around the world and that's this battle truth versus lies. Yeah. Uh, and again, that's all the media, no matter even not just in the States, no matter in, even in China where they ban Bitcoin, but, but everywhere else, uh, Myanmar, when I was talking to people and whatnot, the media just portrays Bitcoin and blockchain as a tool for money laundering, uh, sex trafficking for, for all of these things, right? That's that's like one percent, one percent. And what I learned through on my travels is that for for all of this illegal shit, fiat is still a go to, and it, and it will be, you know. Right. Uh, so so it's this, this these lies that the media is presenting that it's rat poison and big brains, etc., versus the truth, which is that there are genuine people around the world who are creating companies uh, and things on the blockchain that really do want to uh, change the way we do things for the better. And granted, there's a lot of scams. I certainly met a lot of people shilling and scamming it up. Right. But, but man, the people that I met that were really passionate about it, that didn't care about the price, that they were just going to focus on the project, no matter if Bitcoin was going up, down, or sideways. I mean, they, they were inspirational, and I, I want to give them the limelight for a change. That's awesome, man. Um, definitely makes sense. Definitely have makes sense. Have you encountered those kinds of people in your podcasting days and whatnot? You must have interviewed tons of different people, right? You've probably also seen people that, uh, that are really doing amazing stuff on the blockchain. Yeah, you know, I, man, when I really think about it, dude, I feel like I'm really blessed. Um I, this, you know, this podcast, right? Um, when I really started getting into it and really started doing it, first of all, it's hilarious because it really wasn't even my idea to do this podcast to begin with. I had thought, oh, yeah. to yeah, I had thought to do it, but I wasn't in the, like really in the process of actually executing that. So it was with, you know, I'm a part of a, a, a coin team called ECC and their marketing team, you know, we have a really close relationship and they I did a kind of an on the fly interview for the coin because the person who was supposed to do it was kind of last, you know, wasn't able to do it for personal reasons. And I jumped in last minute and then they loved the interview. So they were just like, yo, just jump on and do a podcast. Just start doing a podcast. You start doing a podcast. And I'm just like, I'm like, yeah, maybe one day, but not right now. You know, I'm focused on other stuff. And then literally, literally two weeks later from them saying that they were basically like, hey, you know, you're going to start a podcast because we have John McAfee for you to interview. And I'm just like, um, <laughs> uh, what? I'm like, okay, well, guess I'm going to start a podcast. So, you know, I pretty much fired it up and I feel really blessed because this is, you know, this is still fairly new, right? I haven't even been doing this a year. I started August 21st of 2018, right? But man, the people I have gotten the chance to interview have been absolutely amazing like it's crazy i feel like the it, it, i don't know it's kind of like I, I i it's like certain people are just drawn to it because the whole mm. reason why i created this podcast is literally um like what you were saying about vitalik basically and how when you got to interviewing him it was almost like robotic and i and me personally i hate that Right. Because I feel like right. most interviews are like that in most podcasts and things, you know, they can have a tendency to be very question, answer, question, answer, robotic movement, you know, super monotone. And I'm just like, bro, I hate that. Like, that is the most annoying thing because it's not it doesn't seem genuine. It seems scripted. Right. And I'm just like, no, I don't want to do that. So my whole reason of this podcast and even why I call it the bullpen is because the bullpen in reference to baseball is a place where players, specifically the pitcher, that's their space. And they take that space to prepare mentally and be themselves before they come into the game. So I wanted to create that environment from a podcast perspective to where it's like, hey, when you come on here, do not be a robot. 
be yourself. Mm -hmm. Let people see who you are, which adds to the amazing things that you're doing in the space. And I feel like people just people understand that without, you know, without me even having to say it, people get it and they like it because it just makes things seem more genuine. So, you know, I mean, like meeting people like you, um, you know, I've met so many amazing, amazingly genuine people that really have a passion for blockchain and cryptocurrency are really trying to help get more people to, to understand and learn and educate. And yeah, I, I really consider myself lucky. Like I, I honestly do. Cause I have yet, I literally have yet to interview a single person that ends up being, you know, pull of shit or any of that. Like it's, it's pretty amazing. So, you know, I could, I definitely consider myself lucky, man. It's, it's some amazing people out here in the blockchain and cryptocurrency space, which is why I get so excited when I jump pretty much on a call with anybody. So, yeah. Hell yeah, man. And it shows. It really comes through. Yeah. Your passion and your heart right. comes through. Yeah. And right. we need people like you, man. We need people like you just connecting with other good people and spreading the good word about it. I appreciate it, man. Yep. That's, that's, uh, those other good people are you. (laughs) So that's definitely why you're here, man. It's, uh, yeah, like I said, I just love what you're doing, man. You know, one thing that sucked me in, the thing that sucked me in, the first thing that I saw was, Mm -hmm. dude, I love, 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 love what you titled your book because I was just like, that, that, when I read that, it immediately want me, it immediately made me want to buy the book and read it. I love the title. I'm like, man, like literally like stolen wallets and where to buy them. I was like, what, (laughs) (laughs) what does that mean? What are you referencing? Like, how did you even, how did you come up with that title? Well, I came up with it from just looking through my footage. uh, And there was one point where I'm, I'm walking around with this, uh, with this crypto guy that I met in Bangkok. And he's like, Hey man, you uh, want to go to a really interesting spot? And I was like, yeah, okay. What is it? He said, well, it's the black market. I said, what do you mean a black market? Like the real, like an actual like place you go to black market? And he's like, yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm talking to him about that, and then I have to sh- shut off my camera before we go into there. Uh-huh. So it, it's not going to make it into the documentary for obvious reasons, but it's going to be make it into the book, of mm-hmm. course. And that's another reason why I wanted to write that book and put the book out there is because – you know, reading a book rather than watching the film, you get so much more. And in this case, you actually do get so much more because right. I can write about stuff that I couldn't film. Right. And this was one of the things, you know, going into this black market and here's a stall with like uh, just stolen goods. Um, and, and they're just like back of the truck kind of falling off, you know, things that they got from from trucks that I don't know how they got it from there, right? Or from shipping containers and whatnot. And Right, and here's like electronics on one side, and uh, and then over there like counterfeit stacks of counterfeit money, on another side that looked like the real deal, just fucking wild. And wow. then and then here's this table with just an assortment of wallets on it, kind of like just wallets that you'd walk anywhere else and see. But then yeah, and you you, know, you want to buy a wallet, um, but they they look used. But then you open it up and you're like, hey. Well, wait a minute, this wallet actually has a picture of some dude's family in it. What the hell? And then you open up another one and it's someone's driver's license and other documents in it too. And wow. the receipts for shit. And it's like, holy balls, these wallets were, were back. They're hot. You know, they were stolen wallets. Yeah. Uh, and they, of course, they didn't have any money in them because whoever did the little finger dance and stole them away, um, pocketed the money but then later on they're just sold with all the stuff that was in them and you can buy it and just have a nice fancy little gucci wallet or you can pick it up and maybe you know try and jack someone's identity or whatever but it was just like this, this crazy weird feeling about that this wallet was just in someone's like back pocket or something maybe yesterday or a couple of days ago and now they're missing for it and searching for it and here it is for sale that's yeah, so. that's crazy that there's like a market for that. Like, yeah, <laughs> it's like, do you want to buy a wallet that's not yours? It has uh, all of somebody else's stuff in it, and it's not money. That's right, right, right. It's wow. it's both fascinating and creepy. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> that's wow. That's I don't even know. I don't even know what to say to that. Like, I really don't. That's that is pretty interesting, man. That's by far. Wow, that's yeah. 
Man, yeah, I definitely can't read to read that book, man. I already know it's gonna have a lot of cool stories and 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 perspectives in it from traveling all over. Um, man, that is that is that's that's crazy. But I mean, I guess it's. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, I you're still thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, like it, I mean, I guess it's crazy to us, but I mean, I mean, you know, everywhere has black markets. So I mean, I'm pretty sure there's probably a lot of stuff on those that are probably just seen complete asinine to the average person, but. I mean, hey, I mean, somebody I'm just thinking like what like what is somebody thinking when they're like, ah, you know, what? let me go over here to the market today and see if I can get a wallet that's not mine. Like what? <laughs> like, what are you about to do with that? Like, right, man, right. that's crazy. But yeah, that is true, man. So. Oh, and another cool thing. Right. So obviously this book, this is another cool thing that I saw YouTube video. I watched it, man. So you actually doing a word puzzle contest inside of your book. Like that's right, right, pretty yeah. damn cool. Like you want to you want to talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, man. Um, well, I was inspired by reading these other artists who have hidden Bitcoin prizes in their in their paintings mm-hmm. uh, or or in a mural. There was this one graffiti artist who recently created a mural over in Paris to commemorate the revolution. Mm. And he put in a Bitcoin wallet in there, right? right. A kind of a hidden one. And I always found that very creative and fascinating. So I decided to do that too. And it was really like a perfect little idea because when you generate a new Bitcoin wallet, right, you're given a private key. Right. And if you generate it using some applications, that private key is a 12-word seed phrase right 12 random words yep and if you put them together in the right order you unlock that wallet and everything in it so i thought to myself oh man what if i do something like that like a word puzzle wallet where in my book i will hide those 12 random words and then whoever finds those 12 random words and puts them in the correct order will unlock that wallet and get the bitcoin in it So then I thought to myself, this is just a funny little thing. Uh, It'll be great for people who love crossword puzzles or who play Scrabble to no end, you know, with their family or who just enjoy kind of putting together some clues. So I decided to do that. Already created the wallet. I put, I wanted to, I wanted to put one whole Bitcoin into it, right? You know, and say, hey, you know, hey, if you unlock it, then you could also travel the world on one Bitcoin like I did. Right. But I, I really didn't have the finances to do that. So instead, I put in 0.1 Bitcoin. And then after the book launches on July 9th, after it launches, then at the end of every month, I'm going to tally up the sales mm. and dedicate 30% of those sales to go into that wallet. See, nice. So that wallet, the longer it takes to crack, the bigger and bigger that prize is going to be. I like that. That's going to be cool. That's going to be really cool to see who will get it. And um, you say and how talking- they do it. Yeah, how they solve it, too. So I'm going to be I'm also going to release uh, a, once, a clue once a month on my YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. I'm going to have more videos than that, obviously. But at some point in each month, I'm going to create a little YouTube um, YouTube thing where I, I, I read from the book, maybe or whatnot. And then I also give clues right because for every great mystery there's got to be great clues right i'm going to have one clue so 12 months 12 clues um and we'll see we'll see if somebody's able to put together all those clues nice that's gonna be cool i'm definitely gonna be one of those people (laughs) so (laughs) say that right now yeah that's gonna be really (laughs) awesome man that's that's that was a really cool, uh, uh, I think, addition to the book. That's definitely, I think, going to uh, get people engaged. Um, the fact that you're even taking um, money from your book sales and adding to it, which I think is also another cool incentive. So, you know, another reason for people to kind of organically spread the word about the book, um, get people yeah. buying it more. So, yeah, man, dude, definitely super, 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 super keep me posted on that. Um, I definitely want to see how that goes. I'm definitely going to start telling a lot of people about this. I can't wait to drop this episode. <laughs> Just to let, <laughs> let yeah, man. Know. And you know what we should do after I launch or a couple of months after the launch, whenever, you know, we should do another like follow up uh, podcast. You oh, and I, yeah. and we can talk about a little bit more uh, how it's going and, and all of that good stuff. Maybe give a, 
give a clue on your podcast or something, you know? Definitely. Oh, dude, let's do it. I'm totally down. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. All right. Hell yeah. I, was, I am sold. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you know, me too. Me too. The longer this podcast and me and you talking goes, longer, the more enthused I am. Because I've done a couple interviews, you know, and I got I to gotta hand it to you. You're definitely one of the, the top engaging dude who's out there and talking about stuff. You're engaging, charismatic. Uh, I'm enjoying myself on this on this podcast. So. Oh man, dude, I seriously appreciate that. <laughs> Definitely appreciate it. I mean, yeah, man, I just try to create it. I try to be create an environment that's just real, you know, because this is like, I mean, let, let, let's be honest, right? I could have definitely came on here and I could have definitely just asked you questions, answer, ask you questions, answer. Um, but I'm just like d- that, like annoys the shit out of me. To the utmost degree, <laughs> especially when I have somebody like yourself, like I've watched your YouTube, I've watched uh, uh, your videos and things like that. And, I, you know, I can see a bit of your personality through that. So for me, it was almost almost like doing that would do you a disservice because I feel like you have, mm. you know, such a, a genuine sense about yourself. And I can tell you have a lot of things that, you know, you know, and that you want to talk about. So to me, it's like if it's not organic, if it's not real, if it's, if we can't have do this like a regular conversation then it's like, why am I really doing this? You know, because, you know, I want to create connections and and really get to know people in this space because those are the people that I feel like, you know, we can share resources, we can help each other, we can help push, you know, the blockchain and and cryptocurrency agenda and help educate people. So it's like, it it has to be real. Otherwise, I don't want to do it. (laughs) And that shines through, man. That really shines through. And I appreciate that. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, man. Likewise, I I definitely appreciate it, man. So, uh, oh, this is I, now this is one question I ask every guest that comes on the show. I'm so curious to hear what your answer is with this. Um, what mark do you want to leave on the blockchain and cryptocurrency space? Oh, man, yeah. I think, I definitely think that it's with this documentary and with the book. The, the mark that I want to leave is... It's just pushing the truth out there, just really pushing it out into the mainstream mass audience. I 100%, because 110 doesn't exist, so 100% believe that we will be using blockchain every day, nice. absolutely every day in the future it, for, for all sorts of different things. And when I say blockchain, I don't just mean like cryptocurrencies uh, and paying for lunch, paying for our coffee, right. not just that kind of stuff, but... Uh, I've I've met with people who want to make smart contracts so that your the title to your home is is on the blockchain, right? Yeah, uh, and and that's an actual need because there's things like zombie titles in the traditional uh, traditional um, title world, like zombie titles, where if you sell your home, the the paperwork isn't properly processed, and later on you still owe like taxes or, or painting the home HOA fees, you know, crap like that. I'm getting off topic. I'm sorry. But it's basically <laughs> to just to just <laughs> passionate about this shit. You can tell, man. Yeah, definitely. Uh, is, is to just tell people the truth and, and open up their minds to to the curiosity that they should be feeling about blockchain and open the, up their minds so they they don't take as long as I took, right, seven freaking years. Right to finally get curious about blockchain and open up to it. I want people to rekindle that curiosity and start uh, researching for themselves and digging for themselves and learning for themselves. And if they, if they come up to the conclusion that, you know what, blockchain is nonsense, that blockchain is, isn't anything that they want anything to do with, that's perfectly fine. Right. As long as they just got that curiosity and, and did a little bit of research for themselves. So again, it's not like, I want to push my agenda. I don't want to push that blockchain is the future and is the cure-all Pangea for everything. Right. I just kind of want to open up people to that curiosity again because I feel like they're really shut down uh, in their curiosity. That's true. Yeah, I could definitely agree with you there. Yeah, it's like you, 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 uh, you're going to leave the people to the, to the water and uh, see if they drink. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just see if they're curious again. Just open up that curiosity, open up that mind for for it, and then do your research. And if your answer at the end of that research is no, that's great. But at least you did your research about it. At least you can be confident about it instead of yeah. just believing headlines. You know what? That is so, man, that is so true. And I tell that to people all the time. I'm saying, hey, 
if you're going to make a decision on something, make an educated decision. Make get the knowledge. Perfect. Exactly right, man. Yeah. Exactly right. Get, if I could get, give you a fist bump right now. <laughs> right, right. Exactly right. Air, air, air <laughs> fist bump. Air fist bump. So, no. But, um, air fist bump, yeah. yeah, like it is. That's so true, though, because it's like, you know, if and that's that's my thing. If you do research and then you come to me and you're like, yo, I, I've looked this up and I'm just like, I'm, I'm just not not agreeing or not not understanding or feeling this whole blockchain and crypto thing. That's one thing. But if you're just like, yo, I just went on the Bloomberg and read this headline and I'm like, and then, and then somebody's just like, nah, I hate this. This is stupid. I'm like, really? Like, you're sure you don't yeah. want to do a little bit more research? You want to dive a little bit deeper just so you can really know what you're what you're talking about? So, yeah, man, I couldn't agree with that more. Like, without a doubt. Um, all right, man. Man, it is. All right, so I, I'm going to do a super random, random rapid question. Um, And I, this literally just popped into my head because I was talking about this with uh, a couple of friends of mine on a, on a uh, YouTube live I usually do on Wednesdays and Fridays. But randomly, do you ever think, right, Um, will there ever be a situation where, like, blockchain-based cryptos – them moving into main adoption will actually be derailed or possibly replaced by another technology similar to blockchain. Do you think that that's possible or would happen? Uh, so if I understand the question correctly, cryptocurrencies could be derailed or replaced, right? Um, well, more of the, the I guess the, in the blockchain. So, for example, you know, you have other um, you have other technologies like hash graph and, and um, things like that. Right. Which are, uh, you know, uh, other versions, techno- technological versions of blockchain. It's not blockchain itself, but you have, you know, like I said, like hash graph, you have hollow chain and things like that. Do you think that blockchain will be the thing that it's like, OK, that we're going to ride the whole blockchain wave until mass adoption or do you think it could possibly be like on our way to mass adoption cryptos even though they're using blockchain something else like hash grab or hollow chain is going to be like er, nope and then everybody's going to switch over to that so cryptos themselves will still be around but the technology behind them will essentially evolve mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know what mm-hmm. yeah that's that's a that's a great question <laughs> Um, God, I really want to just say yes and no, but yeah. I know you're not looking for that. <laughs> no, you know what? I'm not. I, I I would accept that only because I kind of feel the same way, honestly. Um, because I mean, when you think about it, right? This is absolutely a completely speculative question. <laughs> so it's like, what what do you actually? How do you actually answer that? But. That answer, I feel like in this question, can definitely make sense. Yeah. Yeah, and it kind of hears why, because, I mean, I think if you would have asked me that question maybe three years ago, then again, I wouldn't have known anything. Yeah. But just judging from where the where the space was, then I would have said, yeah, there could be another technology that replaces it. Mm. Uh, but but now I'm, I'm mixed, and here's, here's why. Uh, because of momentum right Mm. momentum and branding and Mm. imaging Uh, i talked to a very very interesting guy giacomo is his name he's italian love his (laughs) name giacomo (laughs) that's nice (laughs) (laughs) and he he said something very fascinating uh do you know about the five stages of grief yes i definitely do right okay so he said that The world is kind of living through the five stages of grief in terms of Bitcoin and blockchain. Mm. Uh, And the first one is denial. uh, And that's like, we've already passed that denial where people are, no, there's nothing going to happen with this. It's just not, it's not going to be a thing. Mm -hmm. The second one is anger. And we've also gone through that. And that can be seen with like, for example, the, the U.S. government hunting after Ross Ulbrich, even <laughs> yeah. though he was just a programming kid who didn't murder anybody, didn't do anything bad. He just ran or supposedly ran Silk Road, right? right? But they gave him like several life sentences. He's never getting out of jail. You know, that's kind of like anger, just really going after him. Yeah. And sure. there were other times of, during that time, there were other headlines about the FBI busting people with Bitcoin and confiscating it all and all that kind of stuff. So there's denial, anger, um, 
and then ah oh, fuck i'm forgetting them but the next one i think is bargaining or at least that's the stage we're at now right it's bargaining it's like okay we can't kill bitcoin or blockchain so we are going to bargain with it and that's the sec creating guidelines creating rules creating a way to control it right right that's bargaining and then the final stage is acceptance Mm -hmm. Uh, where we're like well this is just the way things are now Uh, we're using blockchain for money for putting titles on our homes for owning digital assets smart contracts it's just acceptance and so what i mean by that is that the terms blockchain and the term bitcoin has such a strong momentum behind it right that it has already pushed through the minds and the time of people around the world and there's laws going to be created around it governing it and how to do it and whatnot so it already has just such a huge uh, huge push behind a huge momentum that i really don't think that it can be unseated now if if uh, blockchain technology if it just comes up with technological um roadblocks that cannot be surmounted yeah. And other technologies like Hashgraph or Holochain are able to surmount those roadblocks with huge, huge improvements. Then, of course, I mean, it has to give way. It right. has to give way. But from what I've seen, from what I've seen, um, we are already well past the point where if Holochain or Hashgraph have decent improvements, but not something monumental, that they'll be able to win. Does that make sense? Yes. I think uh- that, yeah. I think yeah. I interrupted you. What were you going to say? No, no, no. I was going to say, yeah, no, that makes a lot. Of, I, that's a great answer, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. yeah so that's, that's kind of, I think, where we're at. Um, and, and I really do believe that Bitcoin, for example, is going to be a new asset class. Uh, the people ask me my thoughts on Bitcoin. Will it become cryptocurrency that we pay, actual currency, you know, that we pay for our coffee every day with? Right. It's so slow and the mining fees are so high. And I said, well, that's a little bit too narrow of a focus. Right. Uh, because, for example, there was one journalist working for Forbes who tried to go around one day in New York and pay for things with either Bitcoin or with gold. Right. And funny enough, she found more She found places that accepted Bitcoin than gold. She didn't find any that accepted gold. Right. You know, but she was still able to find a cafe, even a preschool that accepted bitcoin versus uh, versus gold they're like no I recognize that it's a gold brick i recognize that it has a lot of value i'd love to take it but right. just i can't take it for this payment or service yeah and so that's that my point with that is that could there be cryptocurrencies perhaps even based on things like um hashgraph or otherwise that we do use for everyday payments or we do use for something else and then bitcoin will still stay around for something that is like gold. It's right. like a store of value, you know, a hedge against other things, a new asset class. I could see that as being the case. We really need to keep a broad, open mind, and we really need to keep our curiosity alive more than De- anything else. Definitely. I agree with that 100%. Um, definitely keeping an open mind. I definitely agree with what you said about it's just as far as uh, branding and you know, I feel like blockchain and Bitcoin, like in a lot of people's minds, it's almost synonymous. It, you know, those words, they almost kind of interchange them um, or even Bitcoin and cryptocurrency all together. So I definitely think branding wise, it has definitely made a mark to where, you know, there's going to have to be something that comes along that is undeniably and more improved and, and more efficient than blockchain in order to really get people paying attention to it, especially if we're still going through the phase of trying to get to mass adoption. Um, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's like looking at Facebook and, uh, and MySpace, right? That's an analogy that some people use. Could there be, could the Facebook of cryptocurrencies come over and squash, uh, the Bitcoin, which is MySpace? And, and I'm saying, you know what, that time has kind of passed because here's, here's what people kind of forget that Facebook came out not long after MySpace. Right. Not long after. Yeah. So the, the amount of people who are using MySpace and the amount of people who still could use a social networking platform was uh, was so big that Facebook could 
could pretty easily trample over it. So their second mover advantage was uh, was viable. But right now, with Bitcoin and blockchain being in people's minds for nine years already, right? Then uh, then then whoever comes up with the next you know, Bitcoin and who tries to be the Facebook of, of this, if, if you're still following my analogy, yep. they're going to have to give something that's just leagues, leagues improved. And I haven't seen anything like that in the space. Yeah. And I'm not sure that I will. And here's why also, because uh, when people look at Bitcoin and they look at the current problems that it has, like slow transactions uh, and and mining fees, when they look at that, they forget that Bitcoin is a technology, right. which means that it's dynamic, which means that it can improve and change. So, for example, in five years from now, I, I think that five years from now, the Bitcoin we use in five years will actually look quite different and much more improved than the Bitcoin we use now. Yeah, you know? it's true. Yeah, that is. yep, that is. That's, that's definitely very true. Um, it's gonna have to be leaps. It's like I said, I, it, it would have to be undeniably and evident. And and I've seen things that have th- the potential to be better than blockchain, but eh, potential doesn't necessarily matter because I mean, there's a lot of people that have potential that never live up to it. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, at the end of the day, you know, you have to put the, the action has to be where the idea is. And I think that I mean, I, I think that even about blockchain in general, you know, um, you know, there's a lot of great ideas out here, you know, but they'll be they'll really be great once they can be executed and they actually exactly. exist. They executed so, and then adopted. Yes. And then yeah. adopted. Great. Yeah, great. Yeah. Really great way to put that. Definitely execute it. And then a yeah, Cause even if you execute it, if nobody wants to use the shit. Probably not going to matter. Much. <laughs> so, exactly. Yeah. That's a good exactly. point, man. Raphael, super, super, super appreciate you coming on to the podcast, man. I've had a blast chatting, dude. I, I'm literally sitting here. I'm having to remember that. Like I'm, I'm, <laughs> and it's funny. Cause I'm sitting here with big ass headphones on it with this big old mic in front of me. And it's, it still feels like so, so genuine of a conversation. And I damn near still forget that I'm doing a podcast. So, that's dope. And that's magic. That's what that is right there. That's magic. Hey, that's what's up, man. Well, um, <laughs> man, again, I super appreciate you coming on the podcast. Um, everybody who's listening, you are like, like, like usual, you know how I do it. I'm going to have all the links to his website, social media book, all of that stuff is going to be in there. So when you go to those show notes, um, please, 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 I'm telling you, especially to YouTube, go check that out. Um, he has some pretty awesome videos on there. Um, make sure you, you, you know, read up on this. I'm worried up on Raphael and what he's doing, his travels, man. I can't wait to see the documentary. I can't wait to read the book. Uh, dude, and you know you're welcome on this show whenever. You're definitely coming back. <laughs> oh, man. Thanks, Lyndon. Yeah. Hey, that's how I say it, right? Lyndon? Yeah, yeah. You got it. Yeah, Linda? you got it right. You All right, it. Lyndon. Cool, man. <laughs> yeah, it was really, really kick-ass to meet you. Thank you again for reaching out like that, for digging through all of the social networking to send that message. I'm happy I caught it. I'm happy I'm here. I'd love to be on the show again. And, you know, who knows if uh, if I'm in the States at some point, uh, we happen to cross paths, that would be fantastic. And, you know, if you're ever over here in Europe, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be here in Poland, maybe another year or so. But if you're if you're out here in Europe, you know, just hit me up, let me know and we'll go get a beer. Dude, I'm definitely down. Yeah, actually. Yeah, I actually plan on visiting Europe within the next year. Um, so yeah, I definitely want to come over there and, and kick it and just kind of see the crypto world over there. So yeah, if I come, I Hell will yeah, absolutely man. hit you and up. I, we can definitely get a bit. I tell you what, I yeah. tell you what, you can even crash my couch, man. Hey, I'm with it. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely appreciate that, man. Wow. That's cool. So yeah. We'd like to thank everyone for your support here at the bullpen podcast all season long and look forward to having you at the next episode. We'd also like to give a special thanks to the team behind the scenes that make this show possible. Today's show notes can be found on our website at thebullpenpodcast.io forward slash post show stats. Also, don't forget to like and retweet us at one bullpen podcast. That's the number one bullpen podcast. And to watch Lyndon do some exciting and probably some weird things too, Tune into the Snapchat at the Crypto Bully. That's at the Crypto Bully. It's been a pleasure, and see you at the next show. Good night, everyone.